I thought about this week and I thought about the direction that we were going to go, uh, I really thought about uh, all of the crazies out there when it comes to football. Now, you might be thinking like those like 300-pound men that like slam their bodies into each other. But when you think about it, they're getting paid a whole lot of money to do that. And, and quite frankly, they've been trained to do that. The real crazies out there are the fans. It, it's many of you guys that go to the games or watch every Sunday I mean, whether you watch from the comfort of your lazy boy every Saturday and every Sunday, or whether you're like full body paint in New England in January, fans are insane. And I love, I love crazy fans. You know, whether you got like cheese heads, which I'm a Packers fan. This is just a beautiful picture to me. Um, my, my fellow Bears fans would be absolutely mocking this and say this is the perfect picture of a uh, Green Bay fan. But nonetheless, and then you've got like the dog pound, you know, those are like the lovable fans that we all know. And then you've got like the crazy like black hole Raiders fans. Have you guys seen these guys? You ever see like the black hole when the Raiders are playing? These guys, like you look at this guy, and I swear, I would think, I would be concerned that if my team beat the Raiders, which is not hard this year because pretty much everyone is beating the Raiders this year, this guy will like come to my house and stab my dog, right? Like I, I do not, he's probably like an elementary teacher, you know, he probably like, he's an accountant, I don't know, you know, probably a very normal job, but I would be terrified to mess with this guy. So we're, this is what we're talking about today, are the fans. That's what the game's about. If there weren't people out there buying tickets, watching every week. I mean, this would, be, this would be nothing. This exists because of all of you. If you consider yourself a fan of football, the game exists for you. And there's no better story, as I thought about the fans that talk about, than the story of the video you saw beforehand, and that's the 12th man. This idea, have you heard of the concept of the 12th man? I mean, really, the true, when you talk about the 12th man, really, you go back to the Seahawks, right? Right? Am I right? The 12th man? Do, do we have, here's, here's the argument. Do we have any Aggies fans in the house? I know we got a few that right now their blood is boiling. Um, I'm about to get sued by Aggies fans just for saying that. No, the, the home of the 12th man really belongs to the Aggies. In fact, today I decided to wear an Aggie shirt uh, just, <laughs> just to represent the Aggies fans out there. We're getting, yeah, some, some cheers, some boos. Uh, the 12th man, now here's the thing. If you don't know the story of the 12th man, first of all, I found out like the Seahawks also call themselves the 12th man, but they license that name uh, from Texas A&M. They've got that trademark. And uh, if you ever try to use that without that, the Indianapolis Colts, uh, a horrible team that Steve cheers for, unfortunately, uh, tried to use that, and they got sued by Texas A&M to not use that name, and they were never able to use it. Um, so they'll sue you into oblivion if you try to use that, unless you pay them money like the Seahawks do. Uh, so I did a little bit of research, and here's the thing. If you don't know the story of how the, the team, or how the, the fans, the, the place got called the home of the 12th man, it's a really incredible story. So for those of you that aren't A&M fans, also known as those of you that can do simple arithmetic, uh, let me go ahead and explain. Sorry, Aggies fans. I'll leave the jokes to a minimum. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to tell you a little bit of the story. It was, I believe, uh, 1922, and A&M was playing an undefeated center college team. Now, this team, not only were they undefeated, I read that year they had scored 298 points in 10 games and only allowing six points all season long. And A&M was playing them, so they're huge underdogs. And A&M was just getting beat up. I mean, their entire backfield was decimated. They had almost no backs left. And there was a player by the name of E. King Gill uh, that was a former player. And now he was up in the stands. He was actually in the press box helping the announcers uh, identify different players. And so the coach, their name, I kid you not, Coach Bible, um, this sounds like a Texas like folk story, uh, but it's true, uh, Coach Bible called up to the press box and said to send him down and for him to suit up. And sure enough, he runs down, he suits up, he walks out onto the field, he doesn't end up making it in the game, but the idea that he was ready, that, he, that no matter what, for his team, he was going to show up, he was willing to be there that's where this idea of the 12th man, that the audience, that the fans, the student body 
is the 12th man of the football team. If you're still wondering, like the 12 men, there are 11 people on a football team on each side of the ball. So 11, one extra equals 12. Again, Aggies fans, I'm helping you too. So anyway, like, so, so that's the idea of the 12th man. And I wanna read this, okay? I wanna read this for you real quick because this kind of sums up this idea at Texas A&M, this 12th man. Let me read this. This is from their like book of like, Lore, I don't know, but I came across this. That spirit of readiness for service, desire to support, and enthusiasm helped kindle a flame of devotion among the entire student body, a spirit that has grown vigorously throughout the years. The entire student body at A&M is the 12th man, and they stand during the entire game to show their support. The 12th man is always in the stands waiting to be called upon if they're needed. Now, here's the thing. I don't care if, you know, if you don't like football all that much, even if you're not an A&M fan, come on, this is a cool story, right? Like, this is the kinds of things that we cheer for. These are the stories like Rudy and things like that that we get behind because we love this kind of devotion, this kind of passion for something. I, when I read this personally, again, I'm, I'm a Packers fan, and then for NCAA, I'm an, I'm an Irish fan, a Notre Dame fan. So for me, story and history, whether it's the Four Horsemen with Notre Dame and the, the, you know, the house that Rockney built, or with the Packers, the Ice Bowl, you Cowboys fans remember losing that game, right? Okay, like things like that. Story and history, those things to me, that's everything. And I love that, that Texas A&M has this kind of a story with their game. And it's so important, the, the place that you play week to week, if, if you know football, really makes a huge difference. So much for that they talk, so much so that they call it a home field advantage. That playing at your home field with your fans cheering you on, they say actually makes a difference in the outcome of a game. Isn't that crazy that the people cheering can make that kind of a difference? And I love that kind of story. And, and what I know to be true is it's not just true in football, but it's also true in life. I mean, we've experienced this in our lives, haven't we? Have you ever had a huge decision that you've had to make? Maybe you're going in for a big job interview. You have a big test the next day. And knowing that you have friends, you have family members, you have people cheering you on, supporting you, praying for you. Isn't that what we want? Doesn't that make us feel a little bit better? Maybe when we're going through an incredibly dark and trying time, to know that there's a community of people behind you, supporting you, again, cheering you on, that helps us make it through that moment, doesn't it? Isn't it great when you've got great news and you've got people that you can call and tell about and they're excited with you? Instead, we've also probably experienced the moment where something awesome happens and you're just like, oh, you... Cool, you know, and there's like no one really to tell around you. It just, it's not the same. I mean, here's the thing. Movies are fun and enjoyable. In fact, I, I don't mind going to movies by myself. Anybody else, like, you, don't, you enjoy going to movies by yourself? Yes, a few of us creepy people that everyone else looks at weirdly when we buy the ticket and we say one and they go, oh. Like, no, just give me the ticket. Um, but I, so I, I love that. But also, it's, it's great with a friend. It's great in community. That we, we need moments where we've got people around us. And in this sense, with this idea, really we all need to have a 12th man in our life. Some of you out there are thinking, and you're like, listen, one man is plenty, right? Like I can do no more men in my life. I have to clean up after one, 12, no thank you. Others of you are thinking like, I would take one man in my life right now, right? Like I would, I would be more than okay with that in my life. I would take one. But, but we all need this idea of, of a 12th man in our life, someone to cheer us on, someone to support us when we're going through difficult times, this kind of community that, that all of us need in our lives. And you see, this isn't just true in, in sports and in life today. This has been true forever. In fact, ancient history records the need of community. If you go back, people without community many times were left out on their own and would die without community. They would die without people around them to support them, to keep that community going. Ancient Israel, there's this uh, incredibly wise person that wrote down all of these kind of sayings and all of these things. And I want to read for you from the Bible something that, that speaks to this idea. It comes from Ecclesiastes. It says this. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. 
If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. I actually almost experienced this this week. Um, we're doing some construction, if you didn't know, here at the church. And uh, I, long story short, very long story short, we have some water issues. So we had to get an excavator and dig a hole outside of our building. So if you see some tarps and an excavator out there, it's because there is a hole there. Uh, it's about five feet deep, and it's allowing water to drain in it. We've had so much water on the ground that we're needing to kind of pump that water out. So I've been coming to the church periodically to pump it out. And yesterday, I came to the church, and the pump had gotten buried. All the ground kind of fell in on the pump. So I had to, like, get myself down in this hole. It's about, you know, four and a half feet deep. And then squeeze down, and the water was about up to my neck, and start digging this pump out. And all of a sudden, the ground started, like, caving in on me. And I got a little nervous because two is better than one and I was about to fall down and be stuck in a hole at the church and be found Sunday morning by one of you. That would not have been a win. So I used my watch uh, to actually call my sister who I saw was here at the church and she came by and got me a shovel and we were okay. But I experienced this, right? There was this moment of like, oh man, this could be really bad. If like this dirt falls into my waist and I can't get out, I don't think that's like, OSHA approved. I think there's supposed to be someone else there. I don't know. Um, but anyway, like we know this, right? This isn't just true with things like that. This is, this is true in life, that life is better when you have someone that you fall down that can help pick you back up, right? In fact, the author goes on. They say more. He says this, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, single men in the room, this is not a, a good pickup line for church, right? Like, don't think of this and go, hmm, two can lie down. Like, yeah, hey, I got this idea for a pickup line. No, don't, don't go that way with it. But here's the thing. We know this is true, right? That, that we're stronger when we're together. A united front is harder to defeat. It, what, what's the old saying? That together we stand, but divided we fall, right? That that it gives us this strength that we can go through our life with. And it's more than just being stronger. It's more than just being more resilient. In fact, one of the things we say here at Icon all the time is that life is actually better when you live it together. Life is more enjoyable when we have community. That's, that's what makes life sweet. I mean, I've experienced this, getting to live life with other people. For me, I, I had a friend that, that I'll never forget. La two weeks ago, they launched their church for the first time. And I'll never forget a few years ago, sitting down at lunch with this friend, as he told me his dreams and he told me what he had hoped for. And I remember him asking, do you, do you think I could do this? Do you think I'm, I'm wired up in such a way that I could start a church from scratch? I mean, do you think we might be successful? And all along the way, I was able to be there. I sit on his board, and I was able to cheer him on and, and watch him go through this. And two weeks ago when they launched, this is amazing, they had so many people show up that they had over 100 people standing out in the lobby watching on TV screens. He said that they had set up a nursing mom's room to be able to watch the live feed, and like people were like walking into the nursing mom's room to watch the video because that was one of the few places they could go. Impromptu, they had to say, you know what? We're going to do another service right after this one. They hadn't planned for it. But getting to take that call that week and hear about that success, and it was so sweet. It was so incredible to watch that journey with them. And I've experienced it firsthand, too, as, as we launched Icon Church. It was really this small group. It was community that started this thing. It was a, a group of people sitting in a living room together. That kind of community is invaluable. And when we don't have it, we feel it. When we're alone, when we feel like no one's with us, that no one hears us, that no one's with us in this battle, in this journey, it's, it's isolating, isn't it? You wonder, like, does anyone care? Does anyone really know me? Does anyone care about what's going on in my life, the things that I care so desperately about? I just want someone with me in this. The author of Ecclesiastes talks about that too says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. You have nothing to, to leave that to. 
when, you, when you're not working for anyone, when you feel like you're just alone in life. And you see, with this in mind, I've got a couple of questions for you today. You see, as we talk about this idea of 12th man, this is important. We need to know, and my first question is, who's cheering you on? Like, who's, your, who's in your corner? Who's supporting you? Who is your family? Because sometimes it, 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 it is a real family, but sometimes our family's far away. So we need this kind of extra set of family. Here at Icon Church, you, you'll hear this. Benji talked about it this week. He said, we don't want to just be a friendly church. We want to be a family church where we know each other's names, that we see each other outside these doors and, and we'll talk to each other, that we create community. And we need to ask ourselves this question, like, who's cheering me on? And, and secondly, who are you cheering on? Whose corner are you in? Who are you fighting for? Who are you believing in? When someone has something that happens in their life, are, are you that person that they call? Are you the person that they reach out to? Because we need both of these. We need someone in our corner cheering us on, and then we need to be in someone else's corner cheering them on. And, and here's the thing. I, 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 love, I love this church, obviously. I love Icon. I love coming every single week. But here's the thing. Can we be honest? If you're coming here and you're only coming for music and to listen to someone talk, you're missing out on it. You're missing out on a huge part of it because quite honestly, I love Benji and the worship team, but you can jump on Spotify and listen to great worship music, right? Listen, I enjoy standing up here and talking, but if you look at what's out there, I'm like okay at best. There are hundreds of churches out there with amazing communicators. You could go online and watch a hundred different sermons this week. So if all you're getting is music and listening to someone talk, you're missing the real life of this. You're missing where community happens. And for me, for my entire adult life where I have found community, where my, the questions of who am I cheering on and, and who's cheering me on has been answered by small groups. I mean, small groups for me really has been my 12th man. I mean, since I, I was 18 years old, small group has been invaluable for me. In fact, it was in that small group, that pastor that I was telling you about that launched their church, that was, it's a mentor of mine, that was my small group leader when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. We've stayed in relationship with each other. Many of the people that were on the original launch team that helped launch this church were, were in my small group. For me, I've experienced this, I, I actually, come to think of it, I met Kelly in my small group. So those single people out there. Like, I'm just saying, like, a little less time on Tinder, a little more time in small groups might do you well. Like, I think Paul talked about that. I think that's in there someplace. I'm not positive, but I think, I think he talks about that. But, right, like, like, I have found so much relationship through small group. In fact, even the small group I'm in now here at Icon Church, in the past month, there's been times that I've gone to the hospital with someone in my small group and prayed with them at their bedside. In my small group, there's been a time that recently that we got together and we talked about a huge life change, this big job offer for someone in our small group, and we sat there and we prayed and we talked through it, and they're able to say, what do, you, what do you think about this? What do you see as the pros and the cons? We're able to have this incredible conversation. Last week, I, I spent a week with someone in my small group and we traveled to Mexico. For me, relationship just continues to happen through small group. For me, this has been incredibly important throughout my life and to this day now. And, and I'm, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. If you show up, if you consider yourself a regular at Icon, and you're not in a small group yet, you don't have that kind of a 12th man in your life from Icon, you're missing out on really the best part. I love Sundays. This is great. But you know what I'm really looking forward to? is tomorrow, is getting together with my small group, especially because one of them is is smoking a brisket. Like, I'm very excited, and our small group is full. Like, if you're thinking, like, Mexico, brisket, like, I'm, I'm, I love you guys. But, you know, that for me is the life of this church. That's where I find my, my greatest joys is in that small group. And I found out that when it comes to relationship and community, really, consistency over time makes all the difference. Because you might be thinking, like, I've tried a small group before, and I went for the first time, and it was kind of awkward, and I get it. It is. Like, every single time, if you've ever started a small group from scratch or, like, showed up at one for the first time, every time it's awkward, isn't it? 
right? Everyone's like small talking. It's like a blind date and you're like, so the weather, um, you know, you're like, oh, what do I go to, you know, and you, you're like, ah, oh, the football, you know, is good. The, the, the football and the, the politics. No, not the politics. We're going to leave that one out. You learn real fast. And it's this awkward moment, right? But consistency over time makes the difference. I mean, it's rare that you meet someone, you decide, let's just be best friends forever, right? If you ever meet someone and they say that, they're creepy, right? Like, that's just not normal, right? It takes time. And it takes consistency, actually showing up week after week. And I get it. You, you might say, listen, I, I've got some buddies at work that I get to go get together with, and that's great. I love that. If you are good friends with your neighbor, that's fine. If you have family close by and you find community there, I, I'm not knocking that. But some of you, you might be sitting here, and maybe you've been coming to Icon for a while, and you just kind of feel like, I, I feel like my spiritual growth is kind of stalled out. You know, I show up here and I'm not growing enough. And, and here's what happens many times as a pastor. As you hear this, you hear, like, I just, I'm not getting fed, right? Well, there comes a point in your spiritual growth that you learn how to use a fork and to feed yourself. And there's a time that in community, you learn to help other people eat more than just once a week. If you're only eating spiritually on Sundays, you're going to be anemic. And small group is this great in-between that happens during the week in the middle of life that you can eat and you can help feed others and that you can grow. You see, and it takes time. And you know what else it takes? It takes intentionality. It takes being purposeful in what you do. It takes saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm tired. There are plenty of days that I'm here at the church and I'm coming home and in the moment I'm exhausted I know that I'm going to be getting home. There's going to be a few things with the kids to take care of. And, and then I think, oh, we have a small group tonight. And I'm just going to be honest. There are times that I'm going, oh, man, like, I just don't know if I have the energy right now. And I have to choose in that moment. No, you know what I need? I need a 12th man in my life. And, and I don't know what, what my friends are going through and what's in their lives. So I need to be that 12th man to them too. What if this week has been a really hard week and, and I need to be there for them. See, for this reason, you can only find community intentionally and in person. We lose something when we only get in community on a screen, in a group, on a page. That's not the kind of community that the author of Ecclesiastes is talking about. We need to be intentional about it, and it needs to be in person. I mean, what would it be like if, if at Texas A&M, all the fans were like, hey, we're super busy, but we're going to jump on FaceTime and we'll be on the Jumbotron, right? Like, we'll cheer you on there. A&M, we're thinking of you, you know, like thoughts and prayers, A&M, you know, like it, it's not the same, is it? Then having that fan base show up, the students standing the entire game, win, lose, or draw, they're there cheering for their team. It's different, isn't it? Sending a text to someone, sure, it's something. There's something altogether different about someone being in person saying, I'm here for you. I'm with you in this. See, that's, that's what this is about. See, church isn't about showing up and sitting in some chairs. We say this all the time, but we really believe that circles are better than rows. I love it that you're here. I hope you're back here next week. I want this thing to continue to grow. But you know why? So we can create more circles of 12th man all around these communities. So we can have these, these huddles that can become family. That can be there when we need someone. When someone needs us, that we're there for them. There have been so many times in my life that I needed someone in my corner. And my small group was that for me. And I know that I need to be that for someone else. So again, if you're a regular here at Icon, this is what we're about. We want to be a church of small groups. Not, not that it's like this thing that we have. that Oh yeah, we've got these small group things. We're a church with small groups. No, we want to be, like we come here 
and we're a gathering of a bunch of different small groups throughout the community. That's what this is about. It's about finding that 12th man. So in a moment, here's what we're going to do. The band is going to play one final song. We're going to end upbeat, celebrating this idea of having someone in your corner, being in someone else's corner. And then we're going to go out these doors, and today we're going to be having a small group rally. As you walked in, you probably noticed some tables along the side. That's representing the different small groups here at Icon Church. And we're adding some more small groups, and we want to create space for you to jump into a small group today. So as we dismiss, you're going to have a little bit of extra time today. We want you to just take a few moments. I know sometimes we, we want to get out of here right away, but, but we're ending a little early so that you can go out there and have some time. It's like speed dating for small groups. Go around, talk to the different leaders. Walk around. I don't know if that's a slogan you should use, but anyway, like go around, take some time to talk to some small group leaders. Get to know them. Ask them what time they meet, where they meet. And find a small group that might be for you. You might be sitting there and you might think, oh, it's going to be awkward. I, I don't, I'm kind of introverted. I know. It always is at first. But lean into this. Because years later, you're going to look back on this day and you're going to be glad that you did. So why don't you today do something that the future you will be glad you did it? Join a small group today. Listen, if you go to a small group a few times and it doesn't work for you, find another small group. But then once you find one, go deep with those relationships. It's not like on day one, you got to spill your life story. It's so that we can build relationships that maybe, just maybe might become that for you someday. So you have some time to go find a small group. And maybe you're out there and you don't find a small group that's a perfect fit for you. Maybe the answer for you then is you create that huddle. You create that 12th man community for you. Our small group leader, her name's Talitha. She's in the back over here. She's wearing a shirt that says, find your circle. And she'll be out there walking around. She has a team of people that'll be out there walking around and they want to connect with you. They'd love to talk to you. So if, if you don't find a small group that's a great fit for you, talk to one of the small group leaders. They'll point out Talitha and her team to you. It'd be a great chance to talk about maybe it's your opportunity to smart, start a small group. You can also go to the info center, talk to them there. They'll point you in the right direction. So I'm going to end with two final questions. The, the questions I asked you earlier, the first one is, who's cheering you on? I mean, really. Not just who are your acquaintances, who are your friends. Like, who really cheers you on in life? When you have a great day, do you have a community that you can call? When you have a really bad day, do you have someone that, that cheers you on? And then secondly, who are you cheering on? Who's in your life that you're behind them, cheering them on, supporting them? Because we need both of these things. We all need a 12th man. We all need to be a 12th man. And I would love nothing more than for this church to become a church of small groups. We've got a goal, and we track the percentage of people that are here on a weekly basis that are actually in a small group. I would love nothing more than to see that number climb. Because what I know then is people here are finding community. They're finding out what church is all about. Because life is just better when you live it together. Amen? Amen. Gig'em, right? Yes. Whoop. Yeah, the whoop too. I guess the whoop is an A&M thing. Whoop. Yes. So let's do this. We'll pray. And then we'll stand together, sing one final song. And then we'll dismiss uh, to go out to the small group rally. Thank you, guys.